Hello, friends. This episode is sponsored by Pilgrimage to Beauty. In the early morning hours of July 28, 1981, Father Stanley Rother, native of Okarchi, Oklahoma, gave his life as a martyr out of love for God and the indigenous poor that he served in Guatemala. Some of our listeners know his story well, and some perhaps have only heard his name, but his story is a great beacon of light in our times. It's the story of a man who inspired hope in a time of desperation, of a faithful priest remaining committed to his call as a shepherd, and the story of courage to love those around you, even when it's inconvenient and difficult. Personally, what I've learned about Blessed Stanley's life is that his heart burned with love for the people that God had called him to serve, even to the point of giving his life for them. And we need inspiring witnesses like this in these times. If you're like me, this might be the opportunity you need to enter more fully into his story and walk where he walked and serve where he served. We've already had a number of Abiding Together listeners go on this pilgrimage and describe it as one of the most transformational trips of their lives. Our very good friends, Annie and Kana Hickman and Emily Blasdale will guide you to the breathtaking shores of Lake Atitlan and feed you delicious local cuisine and accompany you on this once-in-a-lifetime encounter with God and His Saint. Tens of thousands of pilgrims have visited the newly opened Blessed Stanley Rother Shrine in Oklahoma City, but very few have had the experience of praying and serving in Santiago, the village where his heart resides and his mission lives on. This sounds like such a cool trip, and Jake and I can't wait to go one day. So whether you're an adventurer or a contemplative, Pilgrimage to Beauty invites you to Guatemala this July. Visit pilgrimagetobeauty.com slash abiding together to find out all the special perks for our abiding together listeners, including 500 bucks off your registration. Go check it out right now. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, friends. Welcome to the Abiding Together podcast. And we are delighted to be with you on this adventure. And I know that the Lord is going to do wonderful things in all of our hearts. The Abiding Together podcast is a place where you can find connection, rest, and encouragement on your journey with Jesus Christ. And wherever you find yourself in the world, wherever you find yourself in your life, you are most welcome here. And we know that the Lord will speak to you. My name is Sister Miriam James Heidland, and every week I am joined by two of my very dearest friends, Heather Kim and Michelle Benzinger. And we speak about what the Lord is doing in our life. We speak about our sorrowful mysteries, our joyful mysteries, and how the Lord is leading us in it all. And you are most welcome right here, right here. So please grab a cup of coffee, settle in, and welcome home. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Bidings Together podcast. Here we are, our second episode into season 14. Woo! And we have just spent about at least 45 minutes talking before we start recording this. And we've solved all the world's problems, or at least discussed them all. So yeah, just yeah. yeah. So if anybody needs any advice, you come to us. We've got it sorted. <laughs> we have solved nothing, people. We have more questions than we do answers now. And but we but talked, we talked about, about all the problems of the world. world. So now we're just surrendering them to the Lord. That's all we're doing. Yeah. It's being being in human relationships is not easy. Can we just say that? Mm-hmm. Whether it's being a parent or a spouse or a human being, it's just not easy. It's really hard. I mm-hmm. said to Michelle this week, it's going to drive me to drink, I tell you. No, <laughs> not actually, but <laughs> I joke. But <laughs> no, it's hard. That it is, is really mm-hmm. hard. To lean in and love is really hard when you want to be like, forget mm-hmm. you. See you later. But I don't think that's in the gospel. <laughs> it's so true. Like to stay and to stay engaged is really hard mm, is. when you feel like your heart is like in a vice grip. Like it's very hard to just go, no, the place, to, the place, the healthy place is to stay. Mm-hmm. Which is exactly what we're going to talk about today. Hey, how appropriate. And yeah, in our next episode as well. It's almost like we were getting ready to to discuss that. So we are going to, today we're going to talk about living the tension and the tension between joy and sorrow. And then we're going to talk about in a subsequent episode on solitude and community. So we're going to start our episode today. Our guiding scripture is going to be Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12, where it says, You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. And a beautiful quote from Henry Nouwen, who from his book, Making All Things New, An Invitation to the Spiritual Life. Uh, I'll just read the whole paragraph. It's very lovely. He says, our life is a short time in expectation, a time in which sadness and joy kiss each other at every moment. There is a quality of sadness that pervades all the moments of our lives. It seems that there is no such thing as a clear-cut, pure joy, but that even in the most happy moments of our existence, we sense a tinge of sadness. In every satisfaction, there is an awareness of limitations. In every success, there is a fear of jealousy. Behind every smile, there is a tear. In every embrace, there is loneliness. In every friendship, distance. And in all forms of light, there is the knowledge of surrounding darkness. 
But this intimate experience in which every bit of life is touched by a bit of death can point us beyond the limits of our existence. It can do so by making us look forward in expectation to the day when our hearts will be filled with perfect joy, a joy that no one shall take away from us. Oh, he's so good. I love that. I think we can all experience that. We we all feel that. Even reading Henry Nouwen's words, we all we all know that. We all feel that. So, Michelle, do you want to start us off today and kind of just the inspiration behind this episode and what, what was in your heart as we talk about this? Yeah. I mean, it's not a subject that we haven't approached before on the podcast, but mm -hmm. just really thinking about it and having conversation with the two of you and just other different women in my life and just talking about the power of holding things in tension and living the paradox of life. Mm -hmm. Like that is it. And the older you get, the more you realize it and it becomes really tangible in your life. But especially the whole part of grieving and joy, holding that tension. Mm -hmm. You know, when we have mentioned it before on the podcast, one of the most powerful titles of Our Lady is Our Lady of Sorrows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our good friend, Father Justin Brady said that because even when her heart was breaking, she didn't doubt the goodness of God. She mm -hmm. didn't go back on it. And I even think about myself like, even when her heart was breaking, she allowed her heart to stay open and not close it. The swords were piercing mm -hmm. her heart, but her heart was still open. But really learning like, okay, joy and grief, they go together. I just saw something they were saying motherhood is a, a lesson in surrendering and breaking your whole entire mm -hmm. life because it is. It's constantly letting go. But also realizing the more I enter into grieving and lamenting, the more I actually am able to experience joy also. Because mm -hmm. they are, they are being held in tension and they go. And I don't think grieving comes naturally to any of us mm -hmm. or really lamenting comes naturally, but yet it's important to do. You have to grieve losses. Mm -hmm. You have to. And I think we can go further into this when we're all talking. There's also a difference between grieving and wallowing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a good wallower. Like, let me just tell you, I can wallow with the best of them. Mm -hmm. But like where grieving is almost like a physical act where you're surrendering. Mm -hmm. You're like, you yeah. know, bringing stuff to the Lord for him to transform. You are really acknowledging and describing, uh, speaking out what has hurt you. Where wallowing, I just think you just stay in it and focus on the wounds yeah. instead of focusing on the redemption of the wounds. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. So just really diving into that and what does it mean to grieve well so you can experience joy. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Heather, what about for you? Yeah, I, I, we were just saying like when everything in you wants to run away, to be able to stay and experience some of those, I don't want to say negative emotions, but maybe just like heavier, heavier yeah. things. It does open your heart to experience also joy, it, the, the depth of joy. And sister, you've mentioned this a lot, that when we numb ourselves to hard things, we also mm -hmm. simultaneously numb ourselves to the good things. And I don't mm -hmm. think we realize that like mm -hmm. as much as we want to buffer ourselves from pain, which is a normal human experience. To want to say, ah, there's something painful. I want to get out of here or run away. Mm -hmm. This is the mystery of the Christian life. This is what Jesus teaches us is that to press into the most painful things, to enter into suffering well and meet God there. The flip side of that is resurrection. The flip side of that is the deepest joy. And I, I love this quote by Henry Now and especially the end, because I feel like that that is the hope that carries us through the darkest times is to be able to say, I'm, this actually isn't for nothing. Mm -hmm. The suffering but this pain isn't isn't for no reason. Like there there is somewhere that we are going in the end and it's going to be worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you, sister? Yeah, I think holding the tension also indicates that on this side of heaven, life is a mixture of many things and they can all happen simultaneously. I think it takes a lot of pressure off of us to have the perfect moment or in it pulls us out of the deepest pit. All of us have experienced deep areas of sorrow and sadness and it seems like it all encompasses us. Like it totally swallows us up. And Understanding that even in the darkness, there's a bit of light. And even in all the light, there's a bit of darkness. Mm -hmm. And I think it takes away the pressure of, I mean, I think, Michelle, you were talking about at Christmas time of how just being with your family was great, but there's also some really hard things. And I think I know myself, I've had experiences where I've had a really beautiful moments and I let the hard things ruin everything. And then all you remember is the one hard thing versus saying, wow, life is full of many things. And I can, I can, I can let my heart experience both the joy and the sadness of like, yeah, that went really well. Or yeah, that didn't go too well. I wish I would have, I wish it would have gone differently. I think I mentioned, I've mentioned before in the podcast that part of just my uh, really gift of the gift of sobriety that God has given. And the thing, one of the things that's kept me sober for so many years is being able to name simple things like disappointments and allowing mm -hmm. my body to feel that naming a disappointment and allowing my body to feel that and allowing the emotions to run through my body and uh, being honest about that. It takes away all of the pressure that builds up. Then we have to run away and escape versus 
yeah, this is the poverty of the present moment. And there's, there's a lot of different things happening versus like, oh, this has to only be happy or only be sad because that's not reality. Yeah, that's so good. And I think it's so important that you said is acknowledging the disappointments. Yeah. Not like we said before, not wallowing in them, not acknowledging mm-hmm. them. But that also takes time to process them and self-awareness. Mm-hmm. And I realized like even leaning in to my word of the year this year, like re-enchantment, one of the things I am realizing, one of the main, like, I'm like, okay, Lord, teach me the ways of re-enchantment, you know, teach me the rules of re-enchantment. Like, how do you get re-enchanted? Mm-hmm. And one of them is, I think, it, which is a lesson in the spiritual life is pay attention, be aware, pay attention, which, you know, especially like St. Catherine of Siena, St. Teresa yes. of Avila, they're very big on self-awareness, pay attention, pay attention mm-hmm. to the mystery around you, but pay attention to the sorrow. But where is the Lord in the sorrow? And acknowledge that. I think I am famous mm-hmm. for for just pushing through and not processing or like, I'll think about that later. You know, like I'm totally Scarlett O'Hara. I don't have time to think about that now. I'll think about that tomorrow. You know, mm-hmm. pushing through and realizing, okay, what is this? How do I respond to grace and how do I bring the Lord into it? I was even thinking, I pulled up, I love Frederick Buchner and he just passed away, I think last year. And one of his books is called Crazy Holy Grace and it's called The Power of Pain and Memory. It's a beautiful book. He's a beautiful writer. And he says, whenever you find tears in your eyes, especially unexpected tears, it is well to pay the closest attention. They are not only telling you something about the secret of who you are, but more often than not, God is speaking to you through them, through them of the mystery of where you have come from and is summoning you to where, if your soul is to be saved, you should go to next. Mm. And I just love that. Like, pay attention to where those tears are coming. Pay attention to that mm-hmm. tightness in your throat. Pay attention to the tightness. I know for women, a lot of us, is the tightness in our shoulders. And that yeah. usually means we're carrying a load that we were meant to carry. <laughs> Only the Lord was meant to carry. <laughs> you know, pay attention to those things mm-hmm. and invite the Holy Spirit into those moments and say, okay, what are you trying to teach me here? Because he's always trying to teach us something and he's always trying yes. to redeem something at the same time, mm-hmm. I feel like. So yeah. What are your thoughts, Heather? Yeah. And I think as disciples of Jesus, there's always a maturing that we're called to grow in, you know, as we follow Jesus. And I've seen in my, in myself, like I, I, I wasn't as good at this as I am now. And I, I still have lots of room to grow, you know, like I can see the, there's been progress, but I still have, wow, all these places I need to grow. And that's actually been encouraging to me to just Mm -hmm. go, oh, maybe my experience when I was younger before the Lord has taught me a lot of things is different than it is now. And that's, yes. that's actually really mm-hmm. good to note that. And I think when we're younger or we're, <laughs> I'm saying younger, and I don't necessarily mean by age, maybe just say when we're less mature, because that can be at any age, there might be more of an experience of like an emotional gluttony. We just let ourselves feast on all of these emotions and let those mm-hmm. things kind of drive the bus in our life instead of putting them in in right order or, and, and allowing God and others like people in our community to be able to help us put those in right order to go everything I feel isn't the truth mm-hmm. you know I have to acknowledge those feelings yes. but I also have to root them in a truth in the truth who is Jesus Christ and his teachings in the church that's beyond my emotions and mm-hmm. that's why I love that that last line of Henry Nunn's quote is like, it's all rooted in the truth that there is a heaven and one day all of these things will be wiped away. And even in the midst of our suffering, Jesus is here and he is the hope for us all, Mm -hmm. even in the suffering. And so not all is lost. And that's where I always want to go when I feel Mm -hmm. like the most sad and the most sore and the most grief is I just like, there's a part of me that just goes, it will never get better. Mm -hmm. it's going to be like this forever. You know, this is how it always goes. Like these big statements that I just want to throw on everything. It's like, this always happens. I was just waiting for this moment because it always turns out like this. You know, those are things that are just like coming from this emotionally gluttonous place where I'm feasting on the negative instead of holding it in tension with gratitude and goodness. And oh, no, not all is lost. There's, oh my gosh, Jesus, the savior is here to Mm -hmm. walk with me through this. And there's healing and goodness that can be wrapped up mm-hmm. at the same time. Yeah, that's, I think that's harder at times to sit in that, that, really that sobriety and allowing our hearts to feel the sadness and else, but also not indulging in like the areas of self-pity or the resentment, which is all, all part of our hearts telling us something, places where we had, didn't get our needs met or we weren't listened to, or it all makes sense. It's never random, but we have those ways of going back to this. Yeah. Like you said, Heather, Oh, see, this always happens to me. I'm always the victim here. Nobody listens to me. I'm always alone. And the things that we go back to that feel comfortable for us and that feel, I, I know myself when I give into that, it's like, it, it really is like self-indulgent 
Because when I sit down with Jesus and he loves me, but he doesn't talk to me like that. He doesn't say, yeah, you're right. You're always, he just (laughs) just never agrees with my coping mechanisms. I'm like, thank you. And, and cause it's harder, it, it is harder to sit in that sobriety and the maturity and say, yeah, this is really painful. And I am very sad this happened, but it's also not the total truth. And you know what? I have to surrender this to this person or this didn't go the way I wanted, or I don't know what's happening right now, but this is not the end of the story. And I can, I can admit the sadness and I can let myself feel it, but also, and I think it's the other way around too. I don't know about you guys, but I think sometimes naming the longing underneath and the joy, I know for myself, it's been very dangerous at times in my own heart to feel joy or to feel longing or to feel hope or desire because it might be taken away. So it's easier Mm -hmm. to say, Oh, I'll never have that. Or to always name the thing that's wrong. Not just to be content in the present moment. It's no, 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 this is, and I'm like, what is that in me? Like what, what is that self-defense mechanism where I'm afraid of feeling the longing because I'm afraid it won't last. I'm afraid it'll be taken away. And that too, I requires the tender care of the Lord to mature. It, it's just oh we're just so complex at times and it's it's wonderful they're like oh wow yeah we have I, I'm, I'm like i have a lot of growing to do really <laughs> mm-hmm. same <laughs> same i was feeling that a lot this late lately like even just well i was at the seat conference you know and i had to get up in front of like thousands of people which sister you've done a number of times and i was like for the first time you can't know what that's like until you're in the mm-hmm. situation i was like oh wow i i could have been way more supportive to sister the last <laughs> time she did this because then i understood what was going on and i could feel these little parts of me that were like oh i need to mature here in like a confident place in the lord or oh mm-hmm. i need to yeah just rest here and and to not be like oh this is the worst and let myself go down this rabbit hole but just go oh yeah, here's a place I need to grow and and allow myself yes. to be more rooted in who Jesus is. So I, th- I think that's across the board. If we don't know that we should be maturing in the spiritual life, we probably won't mm-hmm. because it actually mm-hmm. takes some mm-hmm. intentional oh, decisions yes. to go, yeah, oh, I'm going to allow myself the stretch here, this, mm-hmm. this tension to be pulled, like to pull me in a different direction so that I can actually grow. Mm-hmm. That's hard to choose. It doesn't feel good. I would much rather just like go soothe myself with a bunch of other things. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Comfort my people. Comfort. Yeah. yeah <laughs> absolutely. Like it's so easy. I don't know if the Lord meant it like that. Yeah, but, yeah. The Lord did not mean it like that, but <laughs> yeah. that's how I want. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, yes. you know, out of context. <laughs> totally so. paraphrasing. But it's funny, like even in scripture, Jeremiah talks about the grieving women. I think it's like Jeremiah 9, 17. I'll have to look that up. But he said the women and that that's what they were called to do. Women that grieve well. Yeah. They would come to the funeral and it made me thinking like, we need to learn how to grieve well. Like that's something that is taught. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, I don't think I've told the story on the podcast before, but for Rwanda, when they were having the trials about the genocide, Mm -hmm. they would come in and they had like, um, someone gave a testimony. It was horrific of something that had happened in the genocide. And the judge stopped the proceedings and said, we need to lament and grieve. Hmm. And the whole community there that was in the courtroom wailed and grieved and let it out. And like, no. I, I mean, I still brings tears to my eyes hearing that story yeah. because there's something about like a public lament and grieving and doing it in the right order, in the right way that that brings redemption mm-hmm. because it literally physically comes out of your body. So it's a somatic thing, yes. but it brings yeah. redemption. And I'm thinking it's like, some, okay, if these women were the wailing women, that's something that needs to be taught. And this is how my mind works too. And then I was thinking more about it. So like almost, and then I was reading something else about grieving. Grieving almost has to be midwifed sometimes. You almost need people around you to like, I need to tell you this longing, like sister was saying, I need to tell you why this hurt. Mm -hmm. And this is why it hurt because there's a longing there or a need there that I didn't feel was met or a disappointment there that Mm -hmm. I didn't feel that was hurtful. And then, okay. And then you need that same person to say, okay, like, where is God redeeming and restoring? You can see it. Where is the gratitude? And it brings you back to, you know, we are big fans of Henry now. And it brings you back to life of the beloved Mm -hmm. where he says the whole book is the premise, like of the Eucharistic prayer. You just take it. And then it's broken Mm -hmm. and then it is given to us. There's Thanksgiving and then it is given to Mm -hmm. us, you know, and that's what we're called is to live these Eucharistic lives where we take the brokenness, hand it to the Lord with Thanksgiving, with grieving. And then he makes it miraculous. Mm -hmm. I've gone back to reading Ann Boskamp's A Thousand Gifts and I've read it twice before, Mm -hmm. but I love that book. We've talked about it before on the podcast, but I mean, I will, it's so interesting. I've read two or three different books this year that I read earlier. And I'm like, 
oh, I was telling another girlfriend, my like, girl, I didn't know what I was reading when I read it the first time. Like after you have a oh little more gosh. life experience, you're like, <laughs> yeah. oh, I didn't know yeah. then what Maturity I knew Maturity again. Yeah. yeah, it just mm-hmm. hits in a different way. And mm-hmm. that is one of the books. And, you know, one of the lines I love that Ian Voskamp says is Eucharist, meaning Thanksgiving, precedes the miracle. Mm-hmm. And so, okay, Lord, what, you know, Satan had meant for harm, you have meant for good. Thank you for this. Thank you for that you're teaching me this. Mm-hmm. But I think also as you grow and mature and all of us will say, I'm speaking for both of you too, like we still got room to grow. Like we are growing. Yeah. Oh, I think I'm just getting more and more comfortable with being poor. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like this is my mess and this is it. And so be it. You know, I guess I just don't, mm-hmm. I think there's something with age that you just don't care about facades anymore or putting on a good front or like, you're like, all right, this is it. Or maybe you're just too dang tired to do it anymore. I'm too <laughs> tired to care. Yeah. Just too mm-hmm. tired to care. That's it. Yeah. There's something about that. Like this is it. And that is the real Eucharistic revival right there. It's the day-to-day life of living with Christ, of allowing him as we receive him sacramentally, body, blood, soul, and divinity is we're allowing him to come into every fragment of our life and to reunite us to himself. I was recently with Jake Heather's husband at a, at a conference and it was just beautiful. He was sharing of how often we were looking for like the one thing that will fix us, like the one talk or the one podcast or the one conference. I'm just going to do this one thing. Or I'll get this one Bible study. And, and he said, can we just release that and just accept that the father gives us the fragments every day? Mm-hmm. And I just, I love the way he put that because I, I've done that too. Like if I'm just going to get this one, if I could just meet this one person who's going to tell me what I need to know, or I'm going to, I'm going to pray with this one person. And that's going to fix everything Then I'm going to have arrived. Then I won't suffer anymore. And then I won't. And it's just not true. And it's so frustrating because that person becomes an idol or whatever it is, it becomes an idol because they're not God. But the, like we talked about earlier, like the poverty of the present moment of the Lord's giving us gifts every day, which requires us to stay little and to continue on this path and on this journey of wholeness and communion. And also requires us to sit with a lot of imperfection in ourselves and in other people and allowing the Lord to speak into that and surrendering that and doing what we can about it, and but surrendering the rest. And it's, it's such a simple way to live. But I, I just, when I look at how Jesus, you know, loves his disciples, like that's how he loves them. Like it's little by little, mm-hmm. it's, it's the fragments of the baskets. It's the fullness of who he is. And he doesn't tell them the whole story at the very beginning. He tells them what they can, what they can bear. And then he gives them what they need. And it's more than enough. It's always enough. There's, there's fragments left over. There's always more than enough. Yeah, I think one of the the major battles that we all face is the battle in our mind. As difficulty comes, what we naturally want to do is find a a reason, you know, to explain like what is happening to us. We usually want to blame someone. Mm -hmm. We want to understand something so we can create narratives. And I think that's a place where we have to exercise extreme caution is what we interpret about God, yes. about others, about ourselves when tragedy mm-hmm. strikes, because mm-hmm. those type of interpretations that then become beliefs and then can take root in our heart can become very destructive if it's not mm-hmm. the truth. And so there's an openness that you both are describing that that we have to have in the midst of difficulty and extreme suffering. And I would say grief is one of a very extreme type of suffering there's an openness that we have to maintain to the truth. And that's something that I've started to do more recently in my life is to just say, Jesus, like I'm, I'm holding all of these beliefs right now that this is the worst, that this always, whatever, and all of these meanings, like I need you to come with your truth here, which is admitting the littleness, Mm -hmm. like as much as I think Mm -hmm. I know everything right now, and I think I can explain and I know who to blame. I just want to say, maybe I'm wrong. And will you come Mm -hmm. with your truth right now? And teach me, teach me what I need to see that I can't see and hear oh, and yeah. feel. And so that disposition of openness, honestly, it's excruciating when you're not used to it. Like mm-hmm. it feels so counterintuitive, right? Mm-hmm. It just feels backwards. And I'm like, but this is the kingdom, is it not? It should be backwards from like what we naturally just want to like, rah, like do in our, in our uh, fallen humanness. But but that's not what Jesus does, you know, and we see that in, in the Gospels as he's suffering. There's this openness always, like, let it be done unto me, Father. Like, it's like, this isn't my will, but what's your will? You know, there's always this communication and openness that he has there, which, gosh, we need to learn more from that. It is. And there was yeah. a situation, Heather, over Christmas, and I just wanted to blame this child. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to blame. Like, someone needed to take 
someone needed to be blamed. And I realized when I was thinking about it, like I tried to pause and I didn't even want to pause. I just wanted to be like, <laughs> you know, like yeah. but trying to pause and just knowing that, okay, blame means that I want control. And I realized, okay, what's the mm-hmm. deeper thing here? I felt like the situation was out of control. And if it feels chaotic mm-hmm. to me, like that triggers something in me. So I just wanted to control. And I just like, I took a step back and I prayed and I was just angry. And the Lord's like, all right, can you surrender instead of blaming right now? Can you surrender yes. the situation mm-hmm. instead of blaming? And I'm like, I want to blame. Like, I mean, it was a wrestle, mm-hmm. you know, like I wanted to blame because, and there was, it was like such a need, like I really, but it was almost like I was just grasping for that control. Cause if I blame, then I can put this into a category that I know, and there will bring me peace. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like this battle, this wrestle and the Lord's, like, can you just surrender it and, and not react and just respond with love and and I did, but y'all, like, it was a battle. It just does not come natural. Yeah, and it, it was is. like a muscle that needed to be worked out. And I mean, man, I wanted to go back to the other way. I mean, and mm-hmm. like, it was one of those situations, like I've said before, I'm like, I don't want to be holy. I want to be right. And I want to be justified. And I want to just, you know, do this. And the Lord's like, can you just surrender? But it was like clenched fists trying to open them. And I did, but it wasn't pretty. My heart was like, it was an act of will. It was not, I wasn't feeling the love at all, Mm -hmm. but afterwards came peace. I wasn't what I would call a peaceful person, but there was a peace that like almost rested on me. Like, okay, it did the right thing, yeah, you know, in the situation. And there was just, yeah, it's just hard. Like, as you were saying, Heather, Mm -hmm. like just growing in that, having that muscle grow and keep on doing the hard thing, even when you're not feeling it. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would say what a victory I would say just just before we jump over, but you're saying it was messy and it was hard. Like it didn't look perfect. I'm like, amen. It's usually not. And that is still good and growth and maturing happening there. Like it usually is messy. It is. It was so funny though. We went out to dinner that night and we were at a sports bar and there was wrestling on TV on one of the sports things. And I was like, who wrestles like that? That is the dumbest thing. And I remember my brother watching it when we were younger, like Hulk Hogan and all those kind of people. I'm like, wrestling is so silly. And I'm a big sports person. I understand like the collegiate wrestling or whatever, but this is when the guys are in the funky mm-hmm. outfits and all that kind of stuff. And I'm thinking about it. And it was just like one of those things. And the Lord was like, hello, you wrestle all the time. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Call me Jacob. Yeah. 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 It is. Yeah. That I, was, I was thinking of Jacob. But I was thinking like we wrestle against not flesh and blood, but spirits. True. Oh, you know, yeah. and I was like, we are wrestlers. Like we wrestle this is with. How we get strong. Yeah. Yep. And the Lord's like, mm-hmm. you wrestle today, Michelle. Like there was a wrestle. You know, you may not like that mm-hmm. wrestling up there, but you wrestle, girl. So now we know what to get you for Christmas. Wrestling singlet. That's what we're going to be saying. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't you dare. Don't you dare. My dad was from the South and he used to call it wrestling. wrestling. So we can wrestle too if you want to you wrestle. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Wrestle. That's for sure. We're fixing yeah. to wrestle. We fix. Oh, yeah, we're fixing. We fix Y'all in the South, we're always fixing to do something. I love it. I love when people say that. It reminds me of my dad so much. Like he would always say, well, we're fixing to leave. I'm like, okay. That's <laughs> can I ask you guys a question? Because you both have have lost your dads, you know, which I think mm-hmm. is just a different kind of grieving that occurs. And I, I'm curious as you, I mean, sister, you have a little bit more time to look, to look back as it happened a little bit further back from Michelle, oh. but what, what did, what's one thing that you both learned through the grieving process? I know Michelle, you're kind of still in, in it in some mm-hmm. ways, but you can also look back a little bit. So yeah, what's something that you've learned in that, that has been helpful to you as you've experienced other things to grieve since then? That's a great question. I think it's allowing ourselves the the space and the time to grieve and not trying to put it in a box or put it on a timeline or say to yourself, well, this is what I should, which is what it should be. And, you know, I, I think um, my, it's been 22 years since my dad passed away. And at the, at, you know, at the beginning, it was really catastrophic for us. My mom was 58 years old. She's a widow of 58. You know, I had to go back to Rome and leave my mom all alone by herself. It was just it was so hard and it was so unexpected for us. My dad was not sick. He just died very suddenly. And just seeing the, fo- and just noticing that this, it, your life changes forever. Like everybody else's life kind of goes on and yours is, is just deeply changed. And, and I, I think letting, like knowing, seeing like, the, what am I trying to say? Like, I, there's so much I want to say, but I guess allowing myself to still grieve that and to still name the losses and to name the sadness at times. Like there are times when we really miss my dad. It would, my mom's life, our whole lives would be totally different. My dad was still there and he's not. And, and there are days like I, you know, there's still, when I go home to visit my mom, there's still days I expect him to come down the stairs with a cup of coffee because he even did that every Mm. morning, you know? And, Mm. 
And there's things I would like now know in my healing process of like, I would have loved to apologize to him for and just to receive him so differently now in my own journey. But I think allowing ourselves to, to give us, and I mean it really like to give ourselves that space as long as it takes and still, and it's okay. You can 22 years later, still name some of the things you miss Mm -hmm. and also know the beauty of, of, I pray, you know, to my dad all the time, asking for, I'm named after him, asking for help, but it's okay to be human. It's okay to have the sorrow and the joy Mm -hmm. at the same time. And yeah, I don't want you to be afraid of that. I guess that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. I would say something similar, allowing yourself the grace and the kindness to go through the process. Like for me, it, it it really did. This year took me down for the count between my dad and my grandfather and a couple other things. Like it was probably the hardest year of my life. And just giving myself a lot of kindness to go through the process. Like I said before, I got really quiet and I'm just coming out of this. I was telling sister yesterday that I feel like Scarlett O'Hara, we were, you have to wear black for a year, you know, like when you were grieving someone that I'm, mm-hmm. okay, I'm putting up my black clothes. I'm coming out of it. And I think I'm coming out of a season of grieving to moments of grieving, but just allow those moments. Like something happened a week and a half ago, and I literally picked up the phone to call my grandfather to tell him the story. Yeah. And I just, and this made me tear up. I broke down. I'm like, mm. he's not there. I can't mm. tell him the story, yeah. you know, and I can in ways like, sure, the veil from heaven and earth is thin, but, you know, just missing his reaction, you know, those are kind of things. But just allow myself to miss those reactions. Yeah. And like we were saying before, naming what we missed. Mm -hmm. and the naming and the remembering but yeah giving yourself permission and that it like sister said it's not on the timetable i think especially Mm -hmm. in our western american culture we're like all right you should be over this by now i know i've done that to other people people often say that too yeah they should be over this by now yeah you know like move on Mm -hmm. and so but that's not fair so yeah wow that's so good yeah i've noticed even for my myself like my my dad is still with us but he had you know a couple of strokes as many people know a year and a half ago and a significant change occurred just his, you know, cognitive capacities and stuff. And I was driving down the road, you know, there's the, it's almost like there's the big grieving at the beginning of the losses that occur, but then there's these little grievings that occur. So I was driving down the road and I was, I have this big decision that I needed to make. And I, I just felt myself well up with tears. I was like, I wish I could ask my dad mm-hmm. for his advice because this is what I've done my whole life. And he's not yes. able to offer that anymore. And, and it wasn't like back to the catastrophic first moment, but it just, I was like, I'm just going to let this grief come and go. Like, so the tears came and I was like, I wish I could have that. Wow. I really miss that. I miss talking to him about my life mm-hmm. and hearing his wisdom. I probably yeah. won't ever have that again, you know? And then I just let it all kind of come and then, and then go. Yes. And, and I think that's a part of it too, is to notice there's, there's waves that come and to not let them just be pushed aside. This is a big deal that I'm learning all of this stuff, not just with grief, but with all emotions to not, not just let them, ju- not just keep pressing everything down, mm-hmm. you know, but to just let it happen. Yeah. You know, it keeps you in a vulnerable place, but that's a good thing. I'd rather a tender heart than a, than a hard one. Amen, friend. Amen. And thank you for naming that. Cause I think mm-hmm. those are the things people are often afraid to name is when our parents or people that we love are still with us who suffer deeply and they're not the same. Or the relationship's not the same. And and that's a real thing. It's a real grief. It's a real sorrow. And to be able to be free to name that is really important. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Beautiful, guys. Well, friends, that was a deep one. There we go. You mm. just never know where the Biting Together podcast is going to lead you right no, next no. to. Yeah, we didn't even know. plan this. We didn't even. Yeah. Michelle threw the topic out this morning. We we're like, mm-hmm. sure. I was like, I don't even know what this means. Let's do it. <laughs> I want to talk about pizza, but I'm like, whatever. Sorrow and grief, whatever. I guess. Like. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Pineapple on your pizza. Discuss. <laughs> Discuss, people. Discuss. Let's get <laughs> to like, oh, The quality has gone downhill in season 14 very quickly. Uh, you guys run things to talk about or what? So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let us do our 1600 one things. Michelle, you want to start us off here, love? Yes. My one thing is, this is kind of funny, is actually Coach Nick Saban because he just announced his retirement oh, when this airs a couple weeks yeah. ago. Yes, he did. Um, yes, he did. Even yeah. I know that. No. Oh, no. way to go, Heather. <laughs> Yay. We're so proud of you, Heather. Aww. I even know who Nick Saban oh, wow. is. So it was so funny <laughs> carry on, when the, carry on. the announcement happened. I mean, we're talking within 10 minutes. I probably had 15 text messages. Michelle, did you know? Did you know? No, did yeah. you know? And, <laughs> you know, avid college football person, do not usually care for the University of Alabama because we're for Auburn in our house. But I have crazy respect for Coach Saban and the legacy that he's left. And we've actually met him twice because he had a lake house up at Lake Burton. I'm not sure he still has one up in the North Georgia mountains. So we were at the camp 
he is actually a very faithful Catholic, he and his wife. I've heard that. We met them at Mass. And so I remember one time we were going into Mass at St. Helena's up in the North Georgia Mountains. And it was when the kids were little. And it was like the sacrifice just to get everybody to Mass with their shoes on. You know, and we're piling in a row. And Chris looks at me and goes, don't look behind you. But your boyfriend is sitting right behind us. And I looked at him. (laughs) And I was so (laughs) aggravated with Chris at the moment because I was just trying to get the kids. And I'm like, what are you saying? You know, like I'm whispering. He's like, don't look behind you. And I look. And there's Nick Saban sitting like, directly behind me. And my heart starts beating quickly <laughs> oh, and whatever. And then Chris leans over like, me and goes, <laughs> do not say War Eagle in the sign of peace, Michelle. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? I was like, I will not. And so I, I would never. And um, his wife, Miss Terry, was so gracious to us. She said a couple of words after mass about the kids. And Chris like, I'm impressed. You gave him the sign of peace. I'm like, that man has won a million national championships. Of course, I'm going to give him the sign of peace. And so, but it was just really funny. So I'm just saying. You're going to give him the kiss a piece. Huh? <laughs> no, Heather, don't go too far. <laughs> the hug a piece. But it was just beautiful. And so just thankful for the legacy mm-hmm. and hard work and commitment and integrity and discipline. And so. I feel like that when Nick Saban announced that, it was like Bill Belichick, also Pete Carroll from the Seahawks. I know. It's just interesting of like the kind of like the passing of the old guard. Uh, and, you know, in many ways of like men who've been around for a long time with certain institutions are like, it's time to, time to pass the baton. I was going to, I couldn't think of another analogy. So the baton, there it is. It's time to pass the whatever baton. football. Yeah, there you know, go. Whatever. Sister and I are going to start a sports podcast also. <laughs> we, we yeah. Should. Yeah, you, you should. You should. I, Father Dave and Bob Rice have a podcast. And at the beginning, I think most of their podcast is just sports. I'm like, you guys missed your calling. You should have just been like ESPN little announcers. Or maybe they're just making it happen for themselves. Okay. So my one thing is the seat conference. It, oh, I, I went, you guys both weren't there, which was sad, but. So I had to rep for the whole team, but thank you for being our thank tribute. you. Yeah. I'm very grateful. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, and you both were probably like, "Hey, I just get to be quiet." So yes, it was a fabulous conference. There was probably, I think, pretty close to twenty thousand young adults that were that were there, and Focus does such a beautiful job. They it was do. like a well-oiled machine. I was like, "Wow, you just couldn't even see a glitch from out there," and they had so many different parts. One of the most tremendous things is seeing all the religious orders present oh, there. It's just it. so beautiful, mm-hmm. like all the different habits, the men, the women, the, oh, wow. I'm like, this is the fullness of the church mm-hmm. here, running into a lot of friends, a lot of our um, podcast sponsors that I got to see there. So that was super, it was just super fun. What a privilege to be there and very encouraging to see all of these young people just on fire for their faith. I was mm-hmm. like, people, the church is not dead. We're Amen. We're gonna. We're okay. Jesus is also alive and well. <laughs> well, and Heather, is your impact session on YouTube on the interwebs yet? Because they published the impact session, so it probably will be by the time this comes out. So I haven't seen it yet. They're just uploading them kind of as they go. Oh, well, we yeah, should. Well, listeners, there. listeners, please go listen to Heather's talk. Oh, yes. Yes. Her so, and I will say, impact session. Who cares about my talk? Listen to Monsignor Shea's talk. He was mm. fire. He was really, really good. Yay! So those are free. You can watch them mm. on C- the Seek Replay. Sister. My one thing is the, I am happy to promote also because Jake Kim is going to be there, the therapist conference hosted Woo-hoo. by the John Paul II Healing Center. So it is March 11th to the 15th in Tallahassee, Florida. So it's for any therapist with an active client list or graduate students are welcome to go as well. So it's a hybrid conference. There's the attendees receive over six hours of teaching every day and also training and practice as well. Opportunities for rest, for fellowship, and it, they just have a really great time. So if you are a therapist and you would like to journey more deeply in your own healing and also learn tools and practical ways to bring your clients into healing and wholeness, I would highly recommend that the therapist conference. And you can go to the JP2 Healing Center and look at their upcoming events. We'll include a link on the on the show notes too, but it will fill up fast. So if you want to go, I would say sign up, sign up. They do a great job. It's awesome. Well, thank you, friends. And maybe, maybe this week, listeners, as we walk together this week, maybe we could just kind of notice those moments in our hearts. So when we're holding both the joy and the sorrow, or we might just notice where we're maybe afraid to feel sorrow, afraid to feel joy, just to kind of allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us in our hearts and, and to bring, bring the truth to the surface so that we can enter more deeply into the life that God is calling us to. So until next week, we will be abiding together. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. If you liked it, would you please share it with a friend and leave us a review? We encourage you to head over to our website, abidingtogetherpodcast.com, where you can find all the show notes, links to our one things, group discussion questions for each episode, and beautiful coffee mugs, t-shirts, journals, and prints in our shop. There you can also subscribe to receive our weekly email with links to each new episode and all of the content. 
We'd love to connect on social media and invite you to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter so you can catch inspiring reflections every day. You're also welcome to join our private Facebook group and dive deeper into discussions with our fellow listeners. If the podcast has blessed you, would you prayerfully consider financially supporting us? The Body Together podcast is only available due to the generous support of our listeners. There are significant costs associated with creating this content, such as tech support, design, website, equipment, and hired staff that we need to be able to continue offering great content. Abiding Together is a nonprofit 501c3, and all donations are tax deductible. You can make donations of any amount through the Patreon website, or you can send us a check directly if that's easier for you. If you donate $15 or more per month on our Patreon page, you become a tribe member and you will receive bonus content every month, such as recipes, music playlist, downloadable prints, and more. You can find all the information at patreon.com slash abidingtogetherpodcast. Thank you so much and God bless you.